secrets hidden in the U.S. debt clock. You're going to be shocked at what you learned today as a silver and gold investor. And we're going to start with the U.S. debt clock because all indications are we could have an emergency on our hands. Today, we're joined by our new friend, Ted. His credentials are impressive, and we will cover those later in the video. But what's even more impressive is what he can teach us about the U.S. debt clock and the secrets for silver and gold investors that are hidden within. Without further ado, Ted, welcome to Ron's Basement. Well, thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me on. I've been following you for a couple of years now, and you always hit the airways with uh, upbeat energy, great news each and every day in silver. And that's got to be just a little bit tiring. So I've been watching your efforts for so long, and uh, we've had a group of about 17 that I've educated here on Austrian monetary economics. But we're going to cover a lot today, and uh, I think we're going to have some fun. Yeah, well, you, you have some shocking information about the U.S. debt clock. Do you want to just dive right in? I know that our viewers out there love to hear about the U.S. debt clock. Most of them are kind of like me. You know, I look at the $34 trillion in national debt and maybe look at the silver to paper to silver ratio. But there's a lot more that silver investors and gold investors can learn from that. Is that correct? Absolutely. And surprisingly, there's only 20,000 subscribers to usdebtclock.org in the first place. So at any rate, uh, folks, if I can get your attention just a little bit here, if you would go online and go to usdebtclock.org, US, all spelled out, US. You know what? Hey, 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 Ted, Ted, I don't want to interrupt you. We, I can pull it up on the screen. Oh, oh. sorry, folks. This is a brand new technology <laughs> for me here. I don't leave, don't, don't leave the live stream. Can can you see it? Can you see it on your screen, Ted? Yeah, I have to look to the side, but I, I okay. see what's going on. Well, that's okay because the viewer right now, what they see is the U.S. debt clock on their screen. Is anybody out there? Oh, yeah. We've got uh, over 150 people already, Ted. All right, great. All right. Well, get the coffee and uh, you might want to steady your hand just a little bit. Look, on this U.S. debt clock in the upper left-hand corner, you're going to see 34 trillion, 411 billion, 162 million, 600, well, now it's 700,000. It's going up faster than I can even read out the, the, the digits. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to notice on the U.S. debt clock is, are you noticing that number going up, going down, or staying the same? It's going up. That's right. So now what I'd like you to do in the same quadrant, and actually in the same section of the con of the uh, the website here, underneath the money creation, it's about two thirds of the way down. What I'd like you to do is go over to this section here. It says US M2 money supply now. Are you yep. with me? Yep, they can see you, Ted. They see your screen and they see your cursor. They see exactly what you see on your screen with the oh, white window. Wonderful. So yeah. you're seeing that it says debt-based, uh, wealth-based, debt-free, non-interest bearing money issued by the U.S. Treasury. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But what I'm pointing out here is a 20 trillion. All right. Think of the 20 trillion as the amount of money that's in your checking account. Are you with me? Yep. So if you owe 34 trillion up here, but you only have 20 trillion in the checking account, is there a problem? Absolutely. Got it. So let's move to the column to the right side, where 621 trillion. This, Ron, represents all the claims against that checking account that you and I have. It might be the value of our home, the value of a portfolio. It might be um, a bet that you made with somebody else. The check has got to clear somewhere. Do you follow me? Yes, yes. So how is $621,000 that is in your account, my account, and everyone that's in the United States of America, their account as well? How can that possibly be cashed with only $20 trillion in the account? Uh, yeah, that's a fraction. The, tw the $20 trillion and the M2 money supply, like you said, that's like just basically checking accounts, cash, all that kind of added all together. Right. But what is that money? What is that number doing now? The M2 money supply, what is it doing? Is it going uh, up, going down, or staying the same? It's going down, Ted. Well, hold it now. You just finished telling me that the U.S. debt clock, U.S. national debt was going up, and the amount of money that's in the account to pay off the debt is going down? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Now, take a look at the currency and credit derivatives. This is anything that would have a claim against the M2 money supply. You follow me? Yes. Like, yeah. suppose you cash out a million-dollar portfolio and say, hey, I'm tired of dealing with digits. I want to get something physical. I want to go back to the money of our country, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, where, where are you on the screen right now with that currency and credit derivatives? Move your, your cursor around so we can see. I got it right here. I'm going to 
Uh, okay. It's right next to US M2 money supply now. Okay. Okay. I see it. I see it. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So now let's do this just for fun. Okay. You got a couple minutes. Let's take the 621 trillion and add to that the 34 trillion. Wouldn't that give us 655 trillion? Yes. And going up, I might add. Got it. Okay. All right. Let's just freeze that number right there. Now we got 20 trillion by which to uh, cash those funds, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's less than 3%. Wow. Ron. Wow. And who has been talking about the value of the dollar coming down to now it's less than 3%. Mm -hmm. Haven't I just proven that to you? Yeah. Look huh. at this. I mean, I'm not making these numbers up. Okay. Now let's suppose that I come through with a check for $19 trillion. What does that okay. do to the rest of you guys? Now, given the currency and credit derivatives now, that would shrink by 19 trillion. Okay. But so with the M2 money supply, then the rest of you guys in the United States are only left with uh, 1 trillion, 844 billion. Okay. So listen, let's go to another section here. Ron, um, you have the ability maybe to put up some, uh, some links and stuff for people to, uh, to yeah, get into. Yeah, we can do that after the uh, live stream. Definitely. Yeah, all right. What I'd like you to do now is on the right side of the screen. Okay. Can you see my cursor? Yep. Yep. Do you see paper to silver ratio now? Yes. You want to know what this is all about? Yes. All right. For every one ounce of physical silver that exists. Now, keep in mind, these are the numbers the government is admitting to. Admitting to, Ron. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means that for every one ounce of physical silver that exists, there are 393 people that think they own it paper-wise. So let's play a little game. We're going to play, what is it? Not merry-go-round. Um, ring around, not ring around the rosy. Musical, musical chairs. chairs. Musical chairs, okay? So we all have our back to what's in the center of the of the, of the the circle, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many chairs are going to be there? One. How many people are going to be in the outside ring that are all holding hands? 393. Are you with me so far? This is very important. Yes, okay? yes. When the music stops, okay? One person sits. 392 are going to fall flat on the floor. Mm -hmm. This is where it really gets interesting. Okay. This is where the story starts to unfold. And this is why you need to keep a track of what's happening. The silver to gold ratio is going to get compressed here. And I'm going to show you why. All right. Okay. Now, the 393 people who just, you know, smashed their bottom on the, on the floor. What do you think they're going to offer the guy that's sitting in the chair with the one ounce of silver? More than market rate? Yes. Hell yes. yes. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'll control myself a little bit here. But um, what's going to happen is this is going to cause what's called, and uh, was it the Bernanke referred to this, as irrational exuberance? Mm -hmm. Hello? Okay. So they're going to do whatever they can because they don't want to get stuck with the paper. What they want to do is they want to actually hold the one ounce of physical silver. Now, let me ask a couple other questions. The amount of silver that we have to be used as money, is that amount finite or infinite? Finite. Absolutely right. What you're going to learn is that things that are real are finite. Things that aren't real are infinite. Things that are infinite are theories. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question here. You're seeing the national debt go up like this. We're going back to the U.S. national debt clock here. Okay? Yep. All right. You see this going north at an incredible rate, right? Absolutely. Would you say that those digits are infinite or finite? They are definitely infinite and synthetic. <laughs> My friend, you hit it right on the head. Now, let me ask a couple other questions. The time that you have on Earth right now, is that infinite or finite? It's definitely finite. Right. The amount of working days that you have, excluding, of course, the days that you might be sick or whatever else, they're finite as well, right? Absolutely. So silver as money, okay, is extremely fungible, meaning that it's as good anywhere in anybody else's pocket. But let's suppose you decide, well, I'm going to spend a little bit less and I'm going to buy silver bars. Are all silver bars the same? Are they recognizable? Is it possible that's inside the silver bar is actually maybe tungsten, tungsten and it's covered with silver? How does a person know? When silver goes up to these real values that we're talking about, how would the 
then soon to be owner in exchange for whatever it is that you want from that person, going to verify that that silver is in fact a real silver bar. Now, if you're dealing with a pre-1965 dimes, quarters, half dollars and dollars, that has provenance to it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that. I know I'm going all over the place. You tell me what you're interested in. Okay. When you deposit money in a bank, all right, you are, you are lending that money to them, you think. But actually, there's another thing that you're doing for them. You're giving up the provenance of that money. And what do I mean by that? When you give the money to the bank, the bank decides to pay you, say, 3% on your money, right? It doesn't end there. Let's suppose they make 10 or 15% on your money. But let's suppose you're real crooked and real criminal. How would you handle this? You would use that deposit, okay, to hypothecate or borrow against to take nine or 10 other loans out right? Mm -hmm. And that is the essence of what's called fractional reserve banking, okay? And that's the system that we're underneath of right now called Keynesian economics. It seems like I haven't come across anyone that's really talking about what is causing the ripples, the currents, and the rapids downstream of where this battle is happening. Mm -hmm. The real battle that's happening right now, take it to the bank, folks, and get this around the world because this is what's happening right now. We have a global battle going on between Keynesian economics and Austrian monetary economics. Keynesian economics is rented is represented by the bis.org. Okay, and I'm going to show you that in a second. But Austrian monetary economics, folks, it's represented by God. We're going back to God's money. We're going back to a constitution. This is where we're headed to. Let me show you who is in control of all the money. Look at this. I went to bi. There you so go. There I brought it up. There it is. It's on the screen. Bis.org, folks. Please do this as your favor. Follow along here. This company is the largest company in the world. They issue all the script fake fiat currency to all the governments around the world. They own all the banks. Okay. BIS.org. Now in this gray search bar ahead, see where it says central bank hub. I'd like you to click on central bank hub. Actually central bank and monetary authorities. I got one step ahead of myself. OK, so if we go, Iran, you with me? Yep. Yep. You're they, they can see what you're doing on the screen, Ted. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. It's new. To, I'll get better with this, folks. Mm -hmm. but you got to get the knowledge here. OK, so we're going to Central Bank Hub and then Central Bank and Monetary Authority websites. OK, now, Ron, with the exception of the letter U, give me one letter of the alphabet. I don't care what letter it is. Uh, I'll say P. P. OK, look at this, folks. They own all the banks in Pakistan, Palestine, Panama, Papua New Guinea, Paraguay, Peru, Philippines, Poland. Are you seeing this? This isn't one bank inside this, the country. This is all the banks inside of that country. And I'm going to show you they own all the banks around the stinking world. Look at this. Look, I don't know why this hasn't come out to now. I certainly hope I don't wind up with somebody in a suit outside. Shoot me for what I'm, I'm sharing with you. But it's all public knowledge. You just got to know where to go to get it. Are you with me? Okay, so let's go under U for United States. We're still up there on U.S. debt clock. All right. Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, Boston, Chicago. They own it all, folks. So what is happening? I'm telling you what's happening. You're watching the systematic destruction and bankruptcy of the BIS.org by a concerted group of people in the United States headed by no less than President Trump, Russian Putin, uh, Russian Vladimir Putin, Modi, and others. They gathered together over 20 years ago to put together a plan to remove the United States and other sovereign countries, all other sovereign countries around the world. Sovereign country is a country that is of itself. Like we're not Paraguay, okay? We're United States. We speak English here, okay? At least those two, all right? So a sovereign country is a country that is then issue, allowed to issue their own sovereign currency, okay? Currency is against the representation of money. Money as defined in our constitution. Can you guys see this? Now they can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The money... Defined in the Constitution. See this book here? Okay. We're going to open this up to Article 1, Section 10. All right. Now, look, I might, I've been too criticized for speaking too fast, but look, here's the deal. If you go down to the bottom of this, uh, this, this uh, podcast being put on, you'll see a little gear looking thing. And if you click on that, you can adjust the playback speed. So right now it's at 100%. You might want to back it down to like 75% or 
I wouldn't try 25. You wouldn't be able to understand it. But uh, I go up to 125 and 150, and I'm typically at 175. So I can take in 75% more information faster by listening at a higher speed. But anyway, if you're, if you're running behind, slow it down a little bit. So anyway, here we are. Article 1, Section 10. Do you see this? Let's see. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You see that? It says, no sh state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin tender, okay, as legal tender, legal uh, uh, money here in the United States. So that is money. Now, currency, it's what's issued against the money. Let me show you something very interesting here. And I and I'm going to ask you a question, Ted, because we haven't really discussed this. I I saw we had Pat Holland on here. He's a, a great friend of our channel. Runs the Missouri Freedom Initiative and is working for legal tender legislation uh, here in Missouri. Um, are you aware of the fact that across the country, I think now we have almost uh, 25 states that either have or have pending legal tender legislation of some form or another that there that there is there has begun to be on a statewide base uh, level uh, a real movement toward allowing citizens to reclaim i like to word use the word reclaim their right to use silver and gold as legal tender like you pointed out in the uh, US constitution absolutely right right yeah. let me show you a couple of things here this is a new $5 bill okay what does it say at the top? Can you read that? Federal Reserve note. Got it. Check that out, folks. Here's an older bill. This is before 1965. What does the top line of that say? It says United States note. Interesting. Look at this. Are they both the same size? Uh, yes. Got it. Why the subtle change? Why the subtle change? Maybe because it became more of a uh, of a of a pure debt instrument. <laughs> Correct. And aren't these called notes, right? Yeah. And when you have a note, say on a car, what does note on a car mean? It means you owe some money. You owe That's some right. value. Yeah. That's right. Listen, this is what I'm going to suggest for you to your folks, and this is what I've been preaching now for about ten years when I first got involved in this. These are redemption certificates. These are not money. Okay, do some research yourself. Don't trust me. Just do it yourself. Money is physical. Money is gold and silver. This is not gold and silver. We already know that, right? Yeah. So if this was convertible into the gold and silver, this would then be called currency. It's not money because it's not real. Okay. So it becomes fiat currency when you can no longer take this in and get your silver from the bank. Now what's happened is very interesting. I got some great examples to show you here. Okay. They have they decided not to continue printing these bills because you know what it costs to print to print a five dollar bill? Three cents. All right, how much does it cost to print a hundred dollar bill? Three cents. Then why is a hundred dollar bill a hundred times more valuable than a one dollar bill or 20 times more valuable than a five dollar bill? Because it's by decree, it's what's called by fiat. You follow me? Yes. Okay. So you're uh, what I'd suggest you do is while the time allots, meaning that let's go back to the national debt clock here, okay? While that $20 trillion is still in the account, wouldn't it make sense for you, you're taking the time to turn tune in here, right? To get mm -hmm. your piece of that $20 trillion out before it's all gone. And then once you get it out, you need the money. You don't need redemption certificates, get the money. And if you're in the United States of America, American silver eagles are money, type one and type two. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Junk silver gives you a way to be able to fractionalize your one ounce purchases. Okay. So a one ounce silver eagle could be worth, well, I've done the calculations. It'll blow your mind. It's well over $20,000. Wow. So yes, it is. Yeah. I, I've done the math on this, but it's not a matter of, of me being incredulous by the number of units of dollars that it would take to buy one unit of silver. Heck no, it's the other way around. Look at the other way around. How many dollars have been created against each one ounce of silver? Mm -hmm. That's the way to look at it. So when you see gas prices going up, it's not because the gas is worth more. It's because the dollar is becoming worth less and less uh, and less. All right. Yes. Hey, Ted, uh, Ted, yes. let's let me I'm going to give you a break for a few seconds while I say thank you to our channel sponsors. Just a few seconds. OK, uh, first, I want to say if, if you do want to uh, convert some of your 
paper that's being infinitely created uh, into real metals. Do yourself a favor, check out Pimbex, P I M B E X, Pimbex.com, online bullion dealer. You know it's where I get my silver. Uh, and many of the basement dwellers have joined me there, and I've had overwhelming positive response with everyone who's worked with Pimbex. If you want gold, silver, platinum, they have it all. Their prices are always the best, ultra competitive. Their selection's great, and their service is second to none. And of course, thank you to Fortuna Silver for sponsoring Ron's Basement. You can learn more about them at fortunasilver.com and our friends at First Mining Gold. You can learn more about them at firstmininggold.com. And I will have a new video interview with their CEO, Dan Welton, coming out this afternoon. Ted, back to you. Okay. So where has this happened in the past? Because all fiat currencies, of which there's over 2,000 of them throughout history. I'm going to show you about these, okay? All right. That'll make that'll make good uh, good kindling for your fireplace, right? <laughs> I'm using them as props right now to help people understand the fact that this is not money. This goes like the wind, okay? Yeah, yeah. And what I'm going to show people right here, Ron, is that this is a Reichsmark, okay? It's a German Reichsmark. They printed so daggone many of these things, Ron. Can you see this? Yes. Yep. Yep. You're full screen, Ted. Can you see that though? Little bit. It's very faint. Hold it. Does Isn't that there... say Ron's basement? I, I can't read it. I don't think there's any ink on the box. There's no, no ink on the back. No. You know what happened, Ron? They ran out of ink. They were, <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. Look, we got to get something straight here because I'm telling you a lot of stuff. Everything I'm telling you is 100% true. Okay. Yeah. Research any part of this. Look, get my email address. And reach out to Ron. If there's, if you have any trepidations or any concerns about what I'm telling you is not true, contact me through Ron. Okay. So what happened was they were creating so many of these uh, these rake marks back then. They ran out of ink. And then what happened? And it, look, that wasn't a one off. Here's the other two that I have here. Okay. You see, <laughs> they ran out of ink. All right. Then what they did, honest to Pete, is they ran out of paper. They ran out of paper. You know what they did then? They made, ban they printed it on bamboo. Hmm. And how do I know this? Because inside the Bundesbank Museum, okay, the Bank of Germany Museum, they have trays and you can pull out these trays and you can see the examples of all the different types of fake fiat currencies that have been created. So why are you collecting this, okay? When somebody obviously collected this, look at right. this. <clears throat> but look at this, look how easy this folds together. At some point in time, Ron, somebody carried this in their pocket so they could feed their family. Mm -hmm. Can they feed their family with this now? No. Got it. Who has this now? I do. For what? Not because it's worth anything, because it helps to explain what's going on. People, you're being fleeced. Uh, do we have time to get into stocks for just a little bit, Ron? I got some things. Let's, let's, why don't we? Well, why don't we? Uh, why don't we save that for next week? Because I think we're going to try to do this on a weekly basis. I I'd like to hear from you regarding how people can protect themselves with silver and gold. I mean, by by default as well. Because and I, and I want to take a step back as well, Ted, because. Um, you know, uh, we want to educate. We all we want to learn, right? And I've got some smart people. And thank you, by the way, to everyone who's here today. Uh, Ted and I both are learning this new platform, so we're 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 working our way through this. But it's a big deal. You know, Ted and I are here talking, but I think he's doing a great job. And you guys know that this is not possible without you being here. So thank you, thank you. Uh, thumbs up. Uh, subscribing to the channel are super helpful. But um, but, the, you know, we're, we're really appreciative that you're joining us. And, and Ted, I appreciate you joining us. I want to say a few things about Ted because he, over the last week, has provided me with uh, a lot of proof of what he's done in his past. And this guy has a very impressive background, including uh, a little stint of in, uh, studying economics at MIT, uh, which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, if I have yep. that correct. So, yes. um, uh, which goes without saying is one of the most prestigious universities in the country. He knows what he's talking about. I wanted to show you this though, Ted, what do you think? What do you think of that? That's uh, a good friend of mine in, uh, 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 in London. 
old, Rich, old, old Richard Cooper sent me that. Uh, when you buy full width toilet paper anywhere, is it just me, folks, or have they shrunk the width of the toilet paper? So now you got to use at least one and a half times more than what you have. Oh, my. We're starting to get dirty here, aren't we? Yeah, no. Well, he, he also sent me an envelope with some cash in it. I think it was $18, uh, which I sent to somebody who's on the uh, on the chat right now, Neil Hahn uh, from Neil Hahn's Dynasty. And uh, Richard Cooper sent this envelope with like, like a, a 10, a five and two singles. And he said, I, I visited Las Vegas. He said, this is Las Vegas toilet paper. So, all right, enough of the toilet jokes. Um, go can, ahead. Can, can interrupt just a second here. One thing I forgot to tell you about folks, and this is really serious. Okay. A guy by the name of Zoltan Polzar has been studying federal reserve reverse repo mm -hmm. operations. And I have a tab I'd like to open up. Yeah. Can you guys yeah. see this? No, you will now. There you go. Now yeah. they see it. All right, folks, look, this is really serious, okay? So what's happening at the end of the day, the leftover cash over and above that's needed in order to fulfill these uh, these Basel one, two, and three requirements basically made so, uh, gold a tier one asset, which is the same as cash, okay? So whatever cash is left over at the bank at the end of the day at five o'clock is what's called an overnight sweep, okay, into the Federal Reserve, okay? And right now, the last sweep was last uh, yesterday at around 2.15 is when the, when the number comes out, the print comes out. It was $502 uh, billion, okay? But it was as high as 2.9 trillion, trillion, okay? Yeah. So what I'm showing you, okay, is a systematic reduction in the M2 money supply, which was the cause of the Great Depression. I wish you could find a couple of people that would debate me on this because I would love to really go to town. On I, I have a I have a question, Ted. Is this uh, a visual demonstration of why we are if we if we go back to the U.S. debt clock as a, a, a visual demonstration as to why we're seeing the M2 money supply shrinking right Ex now? One of the reasons. One, one of the reasons. OK. Yes. And then and then and then I want to educate um, our viewer as well. This is the reverse repurchase uh, agreements, but it's re commonly referred to as the reverse repo program. You mm -hmm. interrupt me if I say something incorrect, but it's my understanding this this operation was created by the Fed to kind of suck in a lot of the excess cash. We all know that during the C-19 crisis, they printed like 40 percent of the U.S. dollars that are in circulation and that this was a way for the Fed to kind of uh, give the banks a place to park their cash, um, uh, the, the kind of excess cash that they had. But now, like you've said, over the last, I don't know, a year and a half, two years, it's been drained out of the system. And it's my understanding that a lot of that has been used to buy all these U.S. treasuries that the government's needing to sell because of the huge debt level and deficit on top of it. And a lot of people think that when that reverse repo program runs out of money, um, who's going to be buying the treasuries? And and then I'll say one last thing about it. To me, it seems like it's was kind of a of a delayed QE or a stealth QE program. Any thoughts on that, Ted? Clearly, I mean uh, Rafi Farber. Do you, does your audience follow yes. Rafi Farber? Yes. Yes. He is a really sharp economist. My gosh, I like that guy so much. He he sees what's going on. He sees that the, the drain in the M2 money supply. He sees that the Fed is taking the dollars in. But what happens if the doll if the Fed doesn't release them the next day? See, these dollars are supposed to come back at nine o'clock in the morning. And why did this even get set up in the first place? You know why? Because the banks were not offering any more than 0.2 or 0.3 percent, but the Fed wanted that money. So they're now offering five and a half percent, but the banks can't earn five and a half percent on their own. So what they do is they sweep this cash out at the end of the day and they give it to the Fed and the Fed holds on to it. What do you think they do with it? There are 22 time zones in the, in the world. What do you think they do with the currency that's in our market, the fiat currency in our market, when our markets are closed? Yeah. Is it possible that they sweep it over into another in another country's market that's on a time zone different than ours. And those funds are not swept and it's made money or whatever over there. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, there are so many ways to slice and dice this that unless you're holding it yourself, don't allow anyone else to hold your money. Don't put it in a vault because the people are going to operate in the vault. They're going to send you the money. They might be paid thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. 
and they're going to send you something worth 400,000 or whatever. No folks. At this point in time, you have to realize, okay, that what Lynette Zhang once said, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And I'd like to add two words to that. <laughs> we do. <laughs> if you're holding real money and everything else is simply a derivative of the real money, like what we talked about in one of our pre-sessions, Exeter's Pyramid, Ron. Yeah. We have to get into that. Yeah, yeah, you can get into that. You can okay, get into that. And I have to. I want to ask you a question, guy. Uh, we, we've got a lot of people. We have almost 500 people joining us today, Ted. Uh, and and this this segment is uh, we're planning on doing this weekly. We're going to call it Ted Speaks. Um, Ted, is it okay with you that when we get to 200 thumbs up, we do a Ron's Basement? live stream tradition and ring the cowbell. Are you okay with that? Sure, absolutely. I was thinking oh. we get a hundred thousand views. We turn it into Ron's attic and blow the roof off his house. <laughs> if, hey man. Uh, he's sitting upstairs and the floor starts to, to rumble or whatever. She's going to know why. Yeah. Because no, I, I, giving I would... out the real information that is not being given out anywhere else. Folks, yeah. am I telling the truth? Have yeah, you heard no, you're, this anywhere else? You're, you know, it, it, I think what it comes, what I hear is there's there's all this evidence about what's going on and at the end of the day i don't know for me ted it just feels like do i want to own paper or i mean it still just blows my mind that i can convert paper into real metal i mean and 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 when you and when you just do a even a a, a very minimal amount of research into what's going on with the money supply with the debt levels actually it, mm -hmm. it just it makes no sense um if you're willing to dig into it. And I can tell you that the people that are joining us today are the people that are willing to dig into it. Absolutely. And I believe they're getting a lot out of what you're saying. So yeah, let's talk about, I'll pull up Exter's pyramid here. There you go. That's full up. screen. Yes, sir. All right. Let me explain this to you here. Okay. This is an inverted pyramid, but this is what has happened to our money supply. Now this isn't a one-off. I'm not, I'm not reading tea leaves or anything silly like that. Okay. What I've done is I've shown you that these currencies all come and go throughout history. What makes the dollar bill any different? Okay, nothing makes it any different. They all become fiat because the politicians want to promise stuff they can't deliver. And the only way to do that is to find a way to pay for those things that you don't see, which is a stealth inflation. Let's get into that just a second. I know we're going all over the place. We might pull the reins in a little bit here. Folks, take it to the bank. I'm telling you, I have a master's in monetary economics from MIT. The only way you get inflation is an increase in the money supply. Everything else you're seeing is, a, is downstream of that. Like what I was talking about as far as the, the Austrian monetary economic gorilla fighting the Keynesian economic gorilla upstream from you. And this is a huge battle. It's God against devil, the evil. This, I'm not trying to get philosophical. Believe me, if you can control the currency of a country, you can control exactly what that country does. Like, for instance, Ron, I'm sure he loves his family very well. And let's suppose I decide to bribe Ron to get him to do something. And Ron says, no, I'm not going to do that. I could tell him, you know what? Your daughters are beautiful. It'd be a shame if something happened to them. These people are evil, folks. OK, now is not the time to trust anybody. In times of war, smart money moves to hard money. OK, and let me show you that with extra pyramid. So at the very tip of the pyramid, can you uh, can you enlarge that possibly, Ted? Is that because it's over on the? There you go. Uh, yeah, it's getting bigger. Okay. I don't know. It's not. There you go. All there right, you go. You guys, how are we doing now? Yeah, that looks good. That's good. Okay. All right. So at the very tip of this is silver. Why silver is the very tip? You know what, folks? Is it possible that we've been lied to? And that silver is actually more rare than gold. Talk to Bix Weird. Anyway, let's not go. That's conspiracy stuff. Let's just talk about facts. Okay. So our constitution says, and I just showed you that. We all remember that, right? Okay. Here's another book. I don't know where the other one is. Okay. Constitution. Only thing we're using as money is gold and silver. What is all this other crap? Okay. Base money. Bank. Are you seeing this, Ron? Yeah. Are you yeah. Yep, we can see it. Bonds, corporate municipal bonds, okay, non-monetary co commodities, derivatives, cryptocurrencies, crypto derivatives, and let's add another one, synthetic derivatives. Yeah. Okay? A synthetic derivative is a bet on a bet. A derivative derives its value from something else. So, Ron, you and I are going to play blackjack, okay? 
One of us is going to win and one of us is going to lose. You got a whole lot of friends. I have a whole lot of friends. Okay. But we're each going to bet a hundred dollars. You with me so far? Yep. Your friends are going to bet my friends that you're going to win. And my friends are going to bet your friends that I'm going to win. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And they bet a hundred million dollars. There's a lot of them. You got a lot of friends and so do I. That's what's called a derivative. Then you have the investors out there. Oh, hey, Ron's group's really good. We're going to bet that Ron's group wins. Ted's really good. We're going to bet that Ted's group wins. And then those two, okay, which are not you and I and not our friends, the people beyond our friends, our friends' friends, and they invest, say, a trillion dollars. You think I'm crazy? No, I'm not. Because the amount of derivatives being held by the banks far exceeds their capitalization. They're, all the banks are busted. That's why you're showing that there's not enough M2 money supply to cover it. So anyway, let's get back to this. So what we're going to see is think of all this other stuff here as wax. And as this all melts down, it's going to melt down away from what it was and into what it should have been, which is silver and gold. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, let me let me throw something in as well. The, it, my, my perspective on the extras pyramid, and by the way, John Exter worked for the New yep. York Federal Reserve. He only died like in 2006. So this is from a, a, a Federal Reserve member who developed this pyramid and argued in favor of it for years and years. Um, but what's interesting to me is that the way I look at it is silver and gold at the bottom are real, right? We know that they're tangible, they're finite, like Ted said earlier. Everything above it, above gold and silver are synthetic. That's our right. make-believe are based on confidence, which starts with the with the three letters C O N, con, right? Which is why uh, I like to say recently, Ted, it kind of dawned on me, like, why has the United States Federal Reserve? It, it seems to me that they're almost less of a bank and more of a public relations firm now, um, and 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 that explains why, because they have to continue. Now with, you know, every week we have 10 Fed governors speaking, right? They have to continue well, with this messaging. They have to prop up the bond market is what's going on. Yeah. They got to talk it up so that the people that are holding the bonds don't dump them. And then yeah. the people that don't hold bonds want them. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I, quite frankly, I think that ship has sailed. I'm, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet and let you, and let you speak. When I look at that pyramid, you know, everything synthetic above gold and silver, we don't need the whole thing to absolutely collapse to see a uh, a big increase in the gold and silver price. Even if just like you said, it starts to melt. That's a good analogy. Or I like to say, if a few of the bricks uh, uh, start to fall out of that pyramid, you know, a few of the derivatives bricks, a few, even mm -hmm. just a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. could result in a huge uh, value or an event that could create a huge uh, a repricing for uh, silver and gold, for that matter. Figuratively, though, can you imagine what the size of gold and silver would be like once these other fake derivatives of the dollar go away and melt down into gold and silver? Because purchasing power never goes away. It shifts, okay? Mm -hmm. So we got this big bubble, and they keep blowing it up and blowing it up and blowing it up, okay? Mm -hmm. But inside that bubble, okay, the, the bubble that's being blown is a small little bubble, and that's the silver bubble. And there's only 0.5% in the silver and the gold physical bubble inside this big balloon. Do you follow me? Yes. So as the other uh, purchasing power shifts from cryptocurrencies, derivatives, non-monetary, you get the picture, right? Mm -hmm. yep. All that nonsense, okay? That purchasing power shifts into silver and gold. You are seeing an epic biblical battle going on right now. And I'm telling you, the cause of all this downstream issue is the global battle that's happening right now between Keynesian economics and Austrian monetary economics. It's being battled out. OK, and the BIS is going to lose. But what you're feeling right now, you're feeling the depth of all the tentacles that the BIS had throughout our society. They've infected our legal system. What's going on with Fannie Willis and the, not Fannie uh, Willis and Fannie? I forget. But anyway, those two people—they're both former judges. Yeah. Both former judges lying before the the, 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 the daggone jury before the judge. Mm -hmm. What kind of respect can you have with the law there? 
anyway, we're getting so 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 Ted, um, uh, because we didn't really define this for everyone at the beginning, and and there were two terms. I'll be honest that uh, that that I'd heard so many times over the years myself. The difference between Keynesian economics and Austrian economics. We explain that to us for 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 novice uh, economists, non MIT educated economists, Ted, if you will. Sure. <laughs> I put my shoes on the way you do too. Okay, Keynesian economics is all about fractional reserve banking. Okay, so that means that Ron puts a thousand dollars into the bank, and if the if the reserve liquidity ratio is ten percent, meaning that the bank can lend out ninety percent of that. That means that Ron's thousand dollars gets credit to him, but then that's given a check for nine hundred dollars to somebody else. They're going to borrow that. OK, they're going to borrow against his thousand. And then that person can deposit another 90 percent of that if the reserve liquidity ratio is 10 percent. But That's a little high. OK, so what I'm saying is that you can take a thousand dollar deposit and create ten thousand dollars liabilities against it. Do you follow me? Yep. Yep. So that's it's the essence of it. It's so it's it's almost to a certain degree. If we if we refer back to the uh, extras pyramid, it's a lot of the things that those synthetic things that uh, that rest above the silver and gold base. Is that right. is that somewhat right. accurate? Yes, yes. And I'm not some savant or anything. This is this is what happens in history. As a matter of fact, um, Sir, uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, I can't remember the furthest you look, the further you look back in history, the more clearly you can see the future. Mm. Okay. Um, hey, who was Winston that? Uh, so, yes, Sir Winston Churchill said that. Oh, the thank you, Margaret. <laughs> the welcome. further you look back in the past, the more clearly you can see the future. I just I want to say one thing. Uh, Ted has Margaret, and Ron, everybody oh, yeah. in Ron's basement knows Susie from Susie's house. So you know, Ted, Ted, uh, Ted, Ted, Ted's got some help, and so do I. And we also, real quickly, Ted, and then Looks I want like to get I back. Need it, it? <laughs> yeah, we need it. Um, yeah, right. Like you know, it's Susie's house, Ron's basement. But nonetheless, I just want to say thank you to Susie and then all the other moderators that are on the live stream today helping out. I'm I'm having a hard time looking, but I know I saw Annie Oakley, Jake from Jake's Custom Parts, Sassy Silver may be here. I don't think Craig is here because he's out on the West Coast. So thank you to all the moderators. Ted, back to you about okay. this. Uh, the further I look back in history, the more clear things become. Correct. Yes. Uh huh. So. Look at these different currency notes, okay? Look at this one. Look at this one. At some point in time, somebody exchanged their labor for these notes, okay? But who owns them now and what it's, what's their worth, okay? So let's ask another question. Since all these fiat currencies fail throughout history, all right, is there a model by which they do fail? What do you think the answer is, Ron? Yes. 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 So what I'm saying is 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 not is not the hopium or whatever you want to call it. It's not a guess. All right. It's what happens. The further you look back in the past, the more clearly you can see the future. Okay. And if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Somebody does. Guess who? The 0.5 percent that own the metal. Look, yeah. folks. You're never going, Ron. You're never going to need another chance like this ever again. Your parents, your grand, grand, your great grandparents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren will never have this op opportunity. We're seeing a shift back globally from Keynesian economics, fake fiat currency running around the world right now to asset backed uh, gold and silver. And of the two, silver is the much better buy because the silver mining ratios are and the paper ratios are out of whack. There's so much we can talk about because currently the paper ratio between silver and gold is like 90 to one. It comes out of the ground at seven to one, but there's more to that story. Of the seven to one that comes out of the ground, 60% is taken right off the market and used for consumption. So that would make the inverse of that are 2.8 units of silver to one. So if you take an ounce of gold, say 2100, keeps math easy, okay? Mm -hmm. And silver is at three to one. Okay. Mm -hmm. You should see an ounce of gold, silver selling for $700. Wow. Now, Ron, I shared some things off screen with you that those numbers, I'm not ready to release those numbers yet, although I could show the math. But clearly, we are well north of $10,000 an ounce for silver. Yeah. Ted, Ted, we have some breaking news right now. Uh, yes. Susie. 
my uh, my my wife, my Margaret, just just sent me a text here in the basement. Um, she just wanted everybody to know that right now the price of gold is up thirty three dollars an ounce. There you go. <laughs> We're magic, Ted. You know, the longer we stay on, the higher precious metals go. Right? Yeah, I'm seeing silver's at twenty three twenty nine. Is up thirty eight cents so far today. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good news for you folks because you know what. It's not going to take very many people whatsoever to wake up and wipe out whatever supplies are there. You're going to find the demand for even sterling plate or silver plate to go to increase as well. They're going to use uh, what's it called electrolysis to remove the silver from the substrate. So it's going to get to be that valuable. And you are going to look back and say, oh, my gosh, I could have bought an American silver eagle for what? Thirty one dollars. Good yeah. grief, folks. Can't you? Man. It's money of your country. Now, if you're in Canada, do we have any can Canadian? Uh, oh, yeah. We have people and from definitely oh, have our friends from excellent. Canada. Folks, um, and I just want to go. Yeah. Well, I want to show something real quick, Ted. This is a 2000. See if I can get that on the screen. That's a 2023 uh, American Silver Eagle. And I okay. just want to show people. You Does mentioned that. Missing notch? Yeah, it's got a Three. missing read. Let me see if I can get that on camera. About the seven o'clock mark, right? Um, it is, uh, this one looks like it's right about at What would that be? Three o'clock right by the Y in Liberty. There's a, one of these little ridges, uh, or I think Ted referred to it as a reed is yeah, missing. Yeah. yeah. You can, maybe you can see it. Can you see it? And I hold not, not real clear. Why don't you sit it? Oh, you can't sit it down. Yeah, I can. not Anyway, this Folks, I don't know that there's another platform that's going to lay it out like this to you all. Hopefully, we can come up with the technology as you can see the missing reed, okay? Reeds, actually, are put around precious metals here, coin, coins in the United States that have precious metal. And the reason why is this. Because a long time ago, when they made uh, coins, say, back in the old uh, Roman days in Lydia, which is where they made the first coins, they took a measured ball of gold or silver, and they would put it on like a die, like an anvil. And this other guy, he, he would have this dot, the other side of the die on what would look like an ads or a big pick. OK, and he would take this and he would slam it down on this ball of metal, leaving the imprint in the top and the die on the bottom would leave the imprint on the bottom. But the outside edges were flowered. So what people would do is they would grab a handful of these shekels or denarius. Oh, by the way, what is the etymology of the word shekel? Where does the word shekel come from? It means silver. How about denarius? Silver. See, if you go back and you take a look at what all the money is from different countries, it all has a root meaning back to silver. Truthfully, I, I, I'll provide all this stuff so that Ron can load it up. And if you guys are interested, just go to his website and download it. So at any rate, when they struck the ball of gold or silver, the outside edges were sort of fl flowered. They weren't uniform. So what people would do is they'd take a handful of these things and they'd shave off the outside edges and they do that's enough coins and they would have enough for a free coin right have you ever heard of the term point shaving before where did that come from how long has silver been used as money didn't judas get paid 30 ounces of silver to drop the dime on jesus and what did he do they threw it in the in the uh potter's field right anyway silver has quite a history OK, and I'm not here preaching silver because I'm, uh, there's anything in it for folks. It's the right thing to do. I did what the system told me to do for 27 years, which is to get our clients together, come in and turn over your stock certificates, these stock certificates. OK, and we would put them in a street account and the street account then would be easier to manage their portfolio. However, look, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, they can see it. OK, see that number up here? NC187300. That is the unique identifier. It's called a QSIP number, C U S I P. Okay. Let me go to QSIP. All right. Are you with me so far? Yes, that's here. There you go. Yep. Okay. QSIP is a universally recognized identifier for financial instruments and their issuers. QSIP identifiers cover a wide range of global financial instruments, including extensive equity and debt issues, derivatives, syndicated loans, hedge funds, and listed options for the U.S. and Canada. Why aren't you holding anything with a QSIP number on it? And who is? You want me to tell you who is? The DTCC, the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation. I have a white paper that I've given to Ron, and this is what it's called. 
Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Uh, no, here. Uh, there it is. Okay. Yep. This is a white paper, and you can download this from Ron. I suggest you do it. This is the only lady that's got it all put together. Look. I have highlighted the, the pertinent sections that I think you should know. Now, you guys can freeze frame. You can read this stuff on your own. But look at this. Street name. Okay? It made it easier for us. But the owner of the certificate, okay, is the one that holds it. And the holder is the DTCC. There were $3.7 trillion. Tell me, Ron, how do you possibly regulate a $3.7 trillion company? You can't. Yeah. They buy off everybody. So, right. Ted, Ted, does this does this um, uh, jive, for lack of a better term, with this um, great the great taking? Are you familiar with the the book oh, yeah. that came out? Yes. Is, yes, is yes. this is this uh -huh. kind of along the same lines of what he's talking about? That's right. It's exactly right. And you're going to be soon learning about a new financial tool called a snowball. Okay. How many of you have heard of snowball? Now, that I'm not going to tell you about because I want to see how many people really want to learn. You really want to learn, okay? Post something, say, hey, Ted's great, or we want to see another one like this. I'd like to see this get up to 1 million views because no one is telling it the way that I am. Yeah. Look, yeah. all these stock certificates, look, they're all missed. They all had a unique identifier. See it? Freeze frame this if you need to. But they all had a unique identifier, and they were issued to you by the company, and the stock certificates were pieces of art. This is beautiful stuff. Look at this. You don't receive that anymore, do you? How many owners of each share of stock are they? How many shares of stock are traded each day? How many times have you been sent a release allow, uh, offering you the opportunity to release your shares to be sold or hypothecated or traded against? They don't need to do that. You know why? Because if you go back and you read your brokerage agreement very carefully, you're going to see that you have given them the permission to hypothecate and rehypothecate your assets. So remember when you put the money in the bank, right? The $100, $1,000 in the bank, they can lend out 90% of that, next bank, 90% of that. You were the one that earned it originally, okay? What they're doing is they're taking your labor and they're fractionalizing it to such a degree that there's nothing left at this point. Yeah, they're diluting it. They're diluting it, right? You, I mean, have, you have no unique identifier on anything you own. But no. Ron, can you put this up on the website? The uh, Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You got it. Folks, listen. There's a reason why the QCIP was put in place. And there's a reason why you don't have it anymore. Let's, let's, suppose, let's suppose that Ron and I, Ron, we're going to own a car, okay? A very okay. collectible car, but the people can see it. They can say they own it, but they can never, never drive it and they can never touch it, okay? Sound like a share of stock? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, now Ron, uh, I say to Ron, you know what? How many times do you think we can sell this car? If we take off the VIN number, yeah. If we take off the VIN number, how many owners for each car could we have, Ron? Uh, infinite. Holy smokes! What happened to the doctor dollar now? Yes. What happened to the share of stocks? Yeah. Look, folks, you don't know me very well. I hope you take the time to learn about me a little bit. I have a 27-year career in financial services. I'm a retired certified financial planner, certified estate planner. Retired investment advisor, every excuse me, registered investment advisor, I'm retired too. Investment advisor representative. I was on the Baltimore Estate Planning Council for many, many years. My forte was setting up revocable living trusts, trust work, high end estate planning, family limited partnerships, uh, CBA, which is certified valuation analyst, where you, you can move more money out of a taxable estate uh, through what's uh, through through decreasing the share cost or values or whatever. That's a whole nother thing. The thing right now that we got going on right now is is time sensitive. Let's go back to the national debt clock. Since we started talking, that M2 money. Yeah, why don't we wrap up with that? I think that's a great idea, Ted. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Let me get you up there. There you go. Full screen at that U.S. Okay. debt clock. Now you see my cursor? Look at this. Move your cursor around so people can see. I am. I am. Okay. We're taking a look at the M2 money supply. Can you see my finger? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. M2 money supply went down since we started talking, folks. And the claims against what's left of the M2 money supply went up. Do you see that? as well as the national debt went up. It's a ticking time bomb. The reason I'm coming on right now is for the last oh, 11 years, I have a group of 17 people I decided I was going to train. 
because I want to try to get back some of that 700 million that I had under management and get that into silver before it's too late. So I'm going back to my clients and I got a team that's helping me right now. And they do research work. They send stuff to me. Other people want to get into it, but I'm limiting it to 17. But not, not. I'm just telling you what I've done and where we're getting the information from and the reason why. The reason why I'm doing this, I'm trying to atone for what I've done. I took your stock certificates and I put them in the street account and you re lost your, your unique identifier. So I'm sorry, but we're going to make good on that. If you follow what I'm telling you, okay, you're not going to lose. Take a look at, Ron, can you put up the, the history, the, the price of silver history? Uh, what is that? The, the his, historical price of silver. Is it is it one of your uh, screens that you have? No, up there? No. Um, we'll, we'll up. You, you can, keep talking and I'll see if I can get it figured out. Like a long term, like a long term chart yes, of yes, silver. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Down in, yes. Well, you, you keep you keep you keep talking, Ted. Otherwise, I'm going to have to sing for everybody and then everybody leaves <laughs> the live stream. So. I don't know. You want, you want Ron to sing? No, 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 no. <laughs> Trust me, they don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so what we've covered is we've covered the amount of debt that's outstanding. We've covered the amount of money that is that uh, is available to cash all these checks that uh, can be written against that twenty trillion is six hundred twenty-one trillion dollars plus a thirty-four. Okay, and then we've also talked about how criminal they are. They're collecting. They've sold three hundred and ninety three paper ounces of silver for every one ounce of silver that physically exists. And I'm telling you, the number is well beyond that. That's all that they're admit, admitting to. But, folks, can you see what's going to happen when the music stops? When the mer 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 no, uh, musical chairs, musical chairs, when the music stops. 392 people admittedly are going to fall flat on the floor and the one sitting in the chair, they're going to have outrageous offers for what it is that they were smart enough to hold on to. So what I would suggest you do is get the money of your country, Canada, you're in, in Canada. You should be collecting, uh, not collecting. You should be saving in Canadian maple leaves. Okay. If you're in England. Okay. I guess they're still working with the, uh, the, the, uh, uh what the Britannia, the Britannia, I think, yeah. is what they're using there. Yeah. And is there a um, is there a coin that they're using in your in Europe for the euro? Do you know? No, I mean, there's the Austrian uh, Philharmonica, um, okay. which is uh, interesting because I was thinking as you were speaking, I hear about Austrian, and 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 and, and I don't think we actually touched on. We touched on Keynesian economics and what that oh. is, right? Debt based right. fractional reserve. Austrian economics is more based upon Real money. Silver and gold is real money, right? And uh, the ratios, and, mining ratios, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. But when all this happens, financial advisors are a thing of the past because you can't fractionalize silver. Okay. And although it will be to a certain degree, because you can, what I'm hearing is they're selling milligrams of gold in guitar right now. There's a thousand milligrams to one gram. What are they selling a milligram for? Folks, it's going to get that scarce because you're looking at 7.8 billion people on the face of the planet. Right. And there is a slide that I would like to give Ron. You don't right, have hey, Ted, to I'm going to pull up a long term. This is the best I could come up with, but I'm going to pull up this long term um, chart of silver. Do you still want to see that? Yes. Yes. OK, this is uh, this came from SD Bullion. But here, let me okay. let me do this and then. Okay. Got it. You okay. got it. OK, that's a long term chart of silver, long term chart of silver. OK. And where are we right now on that? We're currently what, around 20, 23, 22. Yeah. OK. All right. You're seeing still seeing it's off its all time high. Can we take a look at the Dow right now? Can you pull up the Dow? Can you leave this tab open and open up the Dow? please. Uh, yeah. Hold on. I'll go to Yahoo Finance and pull up the... And the reason I'm asking Ron to do this is because you're supposed to buy high, buy low and sell high, right? How much yeah, higher has the stock down. market ever been? More importantly, when you buy low, the absolute best time to buy low is when the asset is hated. And for some unknown so there's reason... So the there's the long-term Dow. Let me see if I can get it on full screen. Okay. So There's what I'm showing on my screen is not what you're showing on your screen is what they're seeing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What you're. Right. Yeah. OK. All right. How much higher has the Dow ever been than today? Hold on. I had marginally. Some compare. Yeah. Marginally so. Right. Right. So why wouldn't you exit out of the paper game 
where you don't have a unique identifier, take the funds if there's still enough left and get yourself some type one American silver eagles without the notch or fractionalize the silver into constitutional silver, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. Okay. Hey, Ted, Ted, yeah. I need to I need to run away for like uh, two minutes. So you keep talking. There's a chart of the long term chart of the Dow. Or do you want me to bring yeah. it back to you on your face? Here, I'll uh, tell you what. Leave, leave it up to Dow because we can talk about that a little bit. OK, because um, can they see me at all, though? Uh, no, oh. they can just see the long term Dow. All right. Good enough. So what you're seeing, though, is you're seeing unprecedented highs in the stock market. Right. So look at it rationally. Let me ask you a question now. Let's suppose that you had whatever it is you have invested right now was $100,000, okay? And it was sitting in cash. Would you take that cash and put it in the stock market? Would you take that cash and put it under the mattress? Would you take that cash and turn it into silver bars? Or you take that cash and put it into the money of the country where you are, okay? What I would suggest that you do is you take constructive receipt of it. Now, there are some people in our group that they wanted to get out large chunks of their IRA money. So they were told, oh, well, if you go down there and you take the silver monster boxes as receipt, then you are re you're receiving, you're getting what's called a uh, constructive receipt, meaning you're taking receipt of your IRA money. However, we have a workaround for that. I'm not, I can't do it for everybody, but I, let me tell you what I did because you might be able to do it with somebody else. So what I did was I went to the, uh, to the place that sells the silver, met the people down there and said, look, I'll tell you what, I will take his 10 monster boxes and he takes my 10 monster boxes because he's not then taking constructive receipt of his 10 monster boxes. All he's doing is he's taking collateral of my 10 monster boxes. And we ran that past the C uh, CPA and it does work. So you do not have to roll your IRA into someplace else where you still have no control and you can't even see it. OK, you can do it this way. Ask for a withdrawal. And you can ask for a hardship withdrawal. OK, if you're under 59 and a half, there might be a 10 percent withholding penalty. They might try to withhold sales tax, excuse me, Maryland taxes for income taxes or whatever, because an IRA has not been taxed yet. OK, but there are ways to get the dollars out. OK, where you don't have to pay the taxes, you can do a rollover. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because there are people out there right now that are targeting people with large IRAs to do a non-custodial rollover. And basically what they're doing is they're taking their funds in the account saying, here, you take them. And they send them off to this guy who sells them silver bars, charges a 7% commission, and then has them sign a paper that the bars have been delivered to a vault and his relationship with the client is over with. You would know who this is, but I don't want to do that on this program. Okay. Yeah. The bottom line is if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And don't let anybody else hold what it is that's yours. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. I'm back that I had to run upstairs and give Susie a kiss. So I'm, I'm sorry. I had to leave you there for a minute. A couple other things I wanted to cover while you were gone. We were talking about some other yeah. topics here, obviously the word dollar, where does the word dollar come from? How did it come about? Actually the word dollar is a bastardation of the word thaler, T H A L E R, which is a German word meaning guess what, Rod? Thaler uh, means silver. Ah, it does. Yeah. So why did Thaler become dollar? Well, say it with your tongue held a couple of times. See how, how nicely it comes out. <laughs> Basically, over time, it went from Thaler to dollar. OK, shekel. What is the et etymology, folks, is the study of language, how words came about. Like most of the words came about from Latin, the romantic word, a language. Like, for instance, the word college is two words brought together. When you collate something, you're going to bring it together. Right. And lege means to read. So the etymological definition of college is to gather and read, okay? And then a university, uni means one, versity place for all, okay? So colleges are inside of a university, okay? The university has one, one university for many schools, and you decide you want to get educated in the, in the music school or the art school or the uh, finance school or the economic schools I did, okay? But anyway, that's, that's where that came from. But anyway, shekel means silver. Let me read this. Look, take a screenshot of that. Look at this. What does that tell you? Is this money? Is this money? Is this money? Is this money? You have to tell me, folks. But I'm telling you, in times of war, smart money moves to hard money. And if you don't hold it, you don't own it. 
somebody else does because all the silver is owned by somebody because it had expenses bringing it out of the ground. Yeah, so, you know, Ted, uh, one of our one of one of our channel friends, uh, bald guy money. Oh, I uh, like he's out of, he, yeah, he's great, super smart guy, great yeah. friend. Uh, yep. He's out of Dubai. He came up. He and I were doing, we're talking, and he we were talking about the value of silver, and he, he came up with this idea. Uh, that like silver is like a battery. It doesn't store electricity, to, but it stores value. All that work that went in, whether it was mined yesterday or mined 3000 years ago, all that work, all that effort that went into getting that is always like stored in that silver. It never goes away. It can be transferred, right? If I give you an ounce of silver, you give me an ounce of silver, we can, but that value is always there. I mean, isn't that awesome? And yeah, right. Every, like in almost every language in the world, world, the word word for money is silver. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they did folks. Come yeah. on. Let's yeah. just get back. Let's, let's get back to simpler things. Okay. My dad used to say, keep it simple, stupid kiss. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay? This is money. Okay. This, if you can cash it in, is a proxy for money, right? Yeah. If you can convert it into the dollars, the M2 money supply, and then take the M2 money supply and actually get the physical silver, okay? So to wrap things up here, okay, this is a representation of money. This is an extras pyramid. This is going to be above silver and gold on extras upside down pyramid, right, Ron? Yep. Got it. Okay. So we know that this isn't money. This is a representation of money, but you don't even own a unique identifier with this. So somebody might say, well, geez, you own American Silver Eagle. Where's the unique identifier with that? Let me tell you, if you take an electron microscope and you dig and look down deep enough into just the surface area of that coin, you're going to find that every Silver Eagle is slightly different, much yeah. like every snowflake is different. So there, folks, is your unique identifier. Yeah. That's your unique identifier. Yeah. So, anyway, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say a couple things. Number one, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I mean, this has been great. We've actually set a record for the most people ever in a Ron's Basement live stream. And I've been doing this for two years. So uh, obviously the message that you're conveying to the basement dweller community, that's what we call ourselves, is very powerful, very pertinent. And on behalf of myself, but also the viewers, um, I want to say thank you for joining us. And uh, Ted and I, uh, unless his plans change, are going to have a, a weekly. Maybe we can, you know, we'll get an actual date every week. But for now, maybe Friday, if that works for Ted, where uh, you can come back on. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of emails, a lot of questions. And um, I think this is going to be a great ride that we go on together. And I, I, I really do salute your genuine desire to help people. I know you worked a long time in the financial services industry and you kind of started to then learn about the value of, of metal and the value of real money. And um, uh, Susie's yelling something at me. Hold on one second. We'll get into more about me, but Ron, okay. if, you can, if you can load this up on your website somehow. Yeah, I don't, the website we have is is limited in that regard. Let is me see what I can. Somebody could see this and say, hey, I'd like to have a copy of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and then you could send it to them or they could get it electronically. Yeah, I can I can forward the email um, that I received from Margaret and if she's OK with that or I can I can put together. You don't even have to do that. I can put together I, anybody who wants that. Just email me and I'll get you a copy of it. Absolutely. Well, that'll tell me how serious everyone is, because I'm damn serious about this. Matter yeah. of fact, while I was talking to you, Ron, I almost teared up a couple of times. This yeah. is this is really serious, folks. You only got one shot at this and it's not going to be a do-over. No, no. Well, thank you, Ted. This has been awesome. Uh, we're going to look forward to more in the future. we got a lot of great comments, a lot of great feedback already. Thank you so much. Folks, thanks very much. Hope you got something out of it. Let's do it again.